Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Hey there, and welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. This is a place of inspiration, education, and hope for a kinder, healthier, and a more sustainable world. On this show, we talk with thought leaders about the things that matter most to you. Our guests, like today's, enlighten and empower us with simple solutions, innovations, and cutting-edge perspectives about the toughest and sometimes the most controversial of life's challenges so that we can more easily face and overcome them. Uh, I want to give special thanks to our show sponsor, New Roots Herbal, for making this program possible. Um, as many of you know, they are one of Canada's most respected natural health product companies, and it's wonderful having their support in this very big vision to help the world be a healthier and better place for everyone. Uh, to learn more about this great company and their natural health products, visit New Roots Herbal. Com. And if you'd like to join the vision of this program by sharing your products or services with my wonderful audience of more than 350,000 monthly listeners as a sponsor, contact me directly through my TeresaNicasio.com website. Be sure to join us next time when Marilee McLean will be with us sharing her disturbing story of trying to protect her daughter from being sexually abused by her father and how the legal system responded to her pleas and also about the wonderful um, efforts that Marilee is, is doing to try to help others um, prevent this, such things happening. Uh, her courage in trying to fight for her daughter is going to deeply move you. Uh, it's quite a story, and, um, yeah, it will make you shake your head. Um, so she's she's trying to help other people with these unthinkable abuses, um, and uh, you know, and really helping shift our our, our legal system um, because it's not necessarily always protecting our children, um, sometimes endangering their safety actually. But for today's program, this is going to be a very uplifting program for all of you. I just can't even describe my gratitude um, uh, to be able to share with you today's very special guest. Uh, the truth is it's not often. I mean, I get great guests, and I love my guests, but it's really not often that I'm able to interview someone who I not only deeply respect as a professional, but has who has also profoundly touched me personally uh, and my family, actually. Uh, for those of you who are also parents of children uh, with learning disabilities, and for those of you who yourselves have struggled with such difficulties in your own life, you are in for a very, very special treat today. Today with us, we have Barbara Aerosmith-Young, one of the greatest pioneers in educational neuroplasticity of our time. So in the 1970s, way, way, way before it was in vogue, uh, Barbara became her own human guinea pig, which all of you know, I'm big on the human guinea pig project. I'm a guinea pig myself. I love doing that. Um, But she creatively applied um, emerging brain science that she learned about, um, in, and she put two and two together, um, you know, looking at the brain discoveries and lab animal research, um, and she applied it to herself by developing um, some non-compensatory based cognitive exercises in order to transform her brain um, that have changed the lives of thousands of people around the world, and for those of you who, you know, we've, some of us have been around since those days, um, you know that like in the 1970s these people thought that we actually could not change our brain. What we had was what we had, and um, we couldn't make a lot of changes. So her, her vision is really brilliant. And also, probably a lot of you know that the compensatory model of learning has really been the standard of care, standard of, of education for pretty much forever. And she just... She, um, she 
she was able to see beyond that, and so she's going to share more about about that um, during today's interview, um, a little bit more about Barbara. So her innovative work was featured in Norman Doidge's book, and you, so many of you know her from there, uh, and film called The Brain That Changes Itself. And really, I think that, um, that Doidge's book really put the Aerosmith program on the global map. Uh, her story has also been um, shared in the new award-winning children's book, The Brain Pioneer, by Howard Eaton, who is very close to my heart. He's the one who founded the school that my own daughter went to, uh, Eaton Aerosmith School, which is phenomenal. <clears throat> But for for Barbara, she suffered herself multiple severe learning disabilities, um, as well as the social and emotional dev devastation um, that so often goes with the territory um, of living with such disabilities. And I'm really excited to to have her voice that here, especially as a psychologist. It um, that really touches me deeply. Um, so her compassion and her courage and her insight, her brilliance are really unsurpassed. Um, in fact, I got some great news this past week that uh, Barbara has just been chosen to receive the 2019 Leaders and Legends Innovation Award from the University of Toronto OISE Alumni Association. Um, and this is a really esteemed award. It, it honors an uh, individual who's fostered novel ideas, approaches, and solutions in their field. And here she is with us today. We're so, we're so blessed. And I just Thank want to you. say on behalf of... I'm blushing. <laughs> Good. That's great. Um, on behalf of my wonderful community of parents and children at the Eaton Aerosmith School, but I want to say also as well as thousands of others around the world who have also um, ever benefited from your program, um, uh, Barbara, many of whom I know are listening today, I want to congratulate you on your well-deserved award and thank you for being a beacon of hope and transformation for our beloved, beloved children. Anyway, there's so much more I can say about you. Um, she's a revolutionary educator and special learning needs activist. Uh, but I'm going to leave it to you, all you folks listening. Um, to, I'm going to leave it there uh, and instead invite you to visit her profile page on the TeresaNicasio.com website. And that's Teresa with an H, T-H-E-R-E-S-A. And like Nancy, I-C-A, two S's like Sam, 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 I-O with an octopus, dot com. Go to that website and, and you'll find tons of information about Barbara, as well as links to her papers, presentations, YouTube videos, and so forth. So I'm just going to leave it there. Barbara, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Oh, absolutely, my my pleasure. I mean, to have an opportunity uh, to speak what I, you know, about what I'm so passionate about, which is, you know, the potential of neuroplasticity to really address and overcome learning difficulties. I, I feel like this has been um, my mission, probably almost from birth, given uh, you know the challenges that I struggled with, having very very severe and specific learning difficulties, and then standing on the shoulders of Giants, Luria's work coming out of Rushka and Rosenzweig's work coming out of uh, out of Berkeley. You know, looking at this concept of if we can identify what's going wrong in the brain, can we apply the principles of neuroplasticity to stimulate and strengthen and improve those weak capacities, those weak functions, to then allow um, the individual to learn with joy and ease and efficiency and no longer struggle with the learning difficulty. So thank you for providing you know, me with the opportunity to talk about this. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I know that a lot of you listening already know um, Barbara and her story, but I, there's some of you probably who haven't yet heard it. And, um, and you know, we, we just have the hour show, unfortunately. We could spend hours and hours. Uh, there's so much wisdom um, that she has to offer, which, again, we'll mention also about her book later about um, where she shares, shares more of it. But, but can you, would you be willing, for especially for those who don't know you um, and have, aren't familiar, as familiar with your work, can you share a little bit about, um, your story, you know, what it was like growing up, uh, because you know we we, you know, we can be like you know, eggheads and, and really have all this knowledge and talk about teaching people, uh, but it's one thing to to learn from the top down. It's another another um, when we've had a story and uh, what we learn from kind of the, the grassroots of our own being. Because um, I know that growing up was not easy for you, and it was way before we knew really about learning disabilities. So can you share a little bit mm. about your your story and a few examples of what it was like? Absolutely. So, 
uh, it was a lot of years ago, <laughs> dating myself. Uh, you know, I started grade one in uh, the late 1950s, and as you noted, this was before there was even the concept of having a learning disability. I mean, the term didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So in uh, grade one, I struggled. I struggled learning how to read, learning how to write, learning how to do, like even understand numbers. I actually got the strap. In those days, they, they did that um, because, you know, the teacher, I think she just was really frustrated. She didn't know why I couldn't learn the way the other children were. Uh, my notebooks were incredibly messy, not that I was doing it intentionally. It's just <laughs> the way I understood my world. Um, and I remember overhearing the teacher talking to my mother in a, in a teacher-parent interview saying basically, you know, don't have really high expectations for Barbara. Um, she has a mental block. There's something wrong. And, you know, she's not going to really go very far in education and I felt in grade one I was given a life sentence of, of struggle and my mother was an educator so she decided that you know she was going to teach me how to read and to write and do basic numbers so every lunch hour I came home and had flashcards after school I came home and had flashcards and you know I kind of joked that I became a workaholic in grade one but that's what it took to just be able to handle the curriculum and my mother was successful in that I did learn how to read, I learned how to write, I learned how to do basic math, but it wasn't overcoming the underlying learning difficulty. I continued through my whole educational career to struggle and, and you know, really what I had significant difficulty was with attaching meaning to things. So my world was that, you know, booming, buzzing confusion that people talk about where I just I just didn't really understand when people talked to me what they really meant. If I read something, I wasn't sure that I understood, you know, what the author's intention was. I would use my incredible memory to memorize things and then put in answers on exams, hoping that I'd matched the answer to the question, but never, never being certain. Um, Laurie had talked about somebody with this difficulty walking around in a constant state of uncertainty and incredible anxiety and that that absolutely uh, you know that was was my life so I learned how to compensate by doing kind of heroic effort which is very typical you see with individuals with learning difficulties they put in 5 10 15 times the effort and often their results don't match the amount of effort they're putting in so some students choose then to stop putting in that effort and others continue I mean I was one of those ones that, that continued I don't know which strategy is necessarily better um, but it was it was an incredible struggle and socially as well because I didn't really understand why things happened or why people uh, did things um, so I struggled academically I struggled socially and emotionally and I struggled um, in sports because I had some areas that weren't working I didn't know where the left side of my body was in space I was incredibly clumsy so my experience growing up was really there was no uh, area that I excelled in so that was that was my journey through school yeah. and and again for those of you listening there's so many more details I mean for example she she reversed her, her letters and numbers were all written backwards she would read or, or try to write from right to left instead of left to right so so just the fact that she was able to learn to read and write and, and do math is nothing less than heroic. And, and so those of you, again, um, we're glossing over a lot because we, o we only have so much time. But it's uh, um, these, her, her experiences were so real. And, and, um, and I'm glad you mentioned about the social things. And uh, I mean, I, it's kind of a funny story, funny, but also it, it's, it, it's just so perfect um, that you mentioned how you would come home to do the flashcards with your mom at lunchtime well well just like you know she's got the compensatory thing um, she discovered the uh, Barbara as I, I read about this that she would see that um, if she did the uh, flashcards near a window she could actually see the light through and, and see what the answer was on the other side of the card <laughs> right um, yes, so yes. And my survival. mother my mother caught on to that right she finally yeah. realized that she put her thumb over the, the Answer, so I couldn't uh, couldn't see it through. But but it's like all children with learning difficulties. We learn to compensate, right? Because yeah, it's exactly. so challenging. So we often find these workarounds, which sometimes teachers think we're cheating, and mm -hmm. whether we are or not, we're, we're just trying to survive to succeed and survive. Yeah. Exactly, survive and to fit in and all that. And, and you you know you also you know, school 
was so it was so tough that you know you found some creative school avoidance you know going to the bathroom for 45 minutes at a time or ways to just not be there even before you really knew what was going on wasn't it Oh, absolutely, and I think I think it was a great four that on my report card it sort of said if Barbara was you know attending school a little more regularly, maybe she'd do better. But I learned how to put the thermometer at that time. It was you know one of those mercury <laughs> thermometers. So I learned how to put it on the light bulb, and then just to get the right amount of temperature, like so, not that I would have to go to the hospital, but enough that my mother figured I couldn't go to school. So um, right. yes, I, I learned how to fake illness, so yeah. I could avoid what was just so challenging so um, traumatic and then you know everything came to a head in grade 8 where I just could not imagine going to high school like I, I, I you know I mean I managed to get through elementary school and in that you know period of despair I actually attempted to end my life um, you know not that uh, you know I, it just I just couldn't I just couldn't imagine a future and no child should feel that way that they are feeling so much despair that they don't see any hope for themselves and that's you know one of the things that you know when I get sometimes discouraged or a little overwhelmed with this work I think about all the children out there you know that may be feeling similar despair to what I felt and that is what motivates me and makes me passionate because no child should experience that. Yeah, and, you know, that's another huge reason why I'm so glad you're here on the show, Barbara. Uh, I actually believe that you, you know, there's many ways that we can save people's lives. Um, you know, every child, every human being needs to have a sense of mattering to at least one person, um, but also every person needs to have a sense of feeling of belonging and that, um, and, and having hope uh, for their, who they are. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean to be hope to be some sort of world leader, but hope that you can, you know, fit in. And and, and find love and find relationships and friendships and um, and I I think that because of the work you're doing and, and this uh, you know, we'll get more into this later about where all the places you're you're helping people and people come literally I mean here in in Vancouver Canada about a third we always around, like a third of the of the campus was people from Australia I mean people literally came from many many countries um, and uh, you know so and, and it's a way to help save our kids lives we love our kids and and Barbara you have been, um, like I said, a beacon of hope, um, and uh, and it's not just for the academics because all the other things that go along with it. You know, for example, when you were a student, you were saying it was hard to socially. So how did you how did you survive those years socially? Uh, you know, on the playground, did you were you able to feel like you fit in, or how you know how did you how did you you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never, I never felt, I never felt I fit in, and and part of the nature of the difficulty I had, and and each learning difficulty kind of has its own flavor and feel to it, and the one that I had, as I said, it meant I just didn't understand what was going on around me. I, I used to talk about how I felt there was a puppet master somewhere pulling strings, and I had no control over anything that was happening, which is is really not a very good feeling to have, like that you're kind of being, bun- you know, buffeted by random events. So I, you know, I had this image as a child growing up, you know, that I was pressing my face against a plate glass window, and there was a banquet happening on the other side of that window, and I could see all these people, you know, happy, relating to each other, having a good time, and I so much wanted to be part of that, but I couldn't. I, I didn't have the cognitive wherewithal to know how to fit in or um, to engage, because the part of my brain that could connect relationships on understand what was going on wasn't working so you know grew up with an incredible feeling of, of social isolation I really didn't have friends or you know maybe I could have one friend at a time um, like kind of serially in a sense right because I, I just it was just too complicated to try to understand people and understand you know multiple different people and you know who they were what they wanted um, so you know uh, very socially isolated and you know, and just poured everything into you know trying to function academically, and pretty much gave up on the social world because I, I felt like I really like a misfit. Um, yeah, yeah, and just like uh, so many, it's just it's it's kind of universal. And, and um, uh, how were you how were you able to persevere? Um, I think it, it, it's a really good question um, that I get asked a lot. Uh, I just. 
it was somehow built into my basic nature. Um, I, I'm not really certain. Um, you know, I, I, my family, you know, both my parents had university degrees, were professionals. It was just kind of a, a, a belief in, in our family, I'm not even necessarily spoken, but that we would all be successful academically. So. There was that expectation, and um, so I think you know that that was very motivating to to keep me driven. And then I had good like I did have some areas that were working. The prefrontal cortex, which is that part that drives. I had no idea where I was driving, but mm -hmm. but that that part of the brain that says like keep on trying uh, was working. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, you know what? We do need to take a short break, folks. The time just flies. Um, uh, so stick around. We're going to hear more from Barbara and hear more about the turning point and, uh, you know, what happened and how she's the school she's created and, and, and some of the research that's been coming out of it. Um, anyway, lots more good stuff to, to hear from, from this incredible woman. Um, so stick around. We'll be right back. Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's NewRootsHerbal.com. Audiobooks gives you instant access to over 50,000 of the best sellers and hottest book titles in romance, mystery, fiction, and many other genres. Just visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on Audiobooks to get started. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, the blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Com. If you like to spend your television viewing time learning about some of the things that you may have missed in history class or if history was your favorite subject, then you should check out the link to the History Channel on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page. Order DVD sets by series or by subject matter right from our homepage while you still enjoy your favorite HealthyLife.net show. Being inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604- Four four five six four six three. You're listening to HealthyLife.net, the radio network that brings positive talk with positive change to make your world a little better. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just joining us, uh, today we're here with brain pioneer, educator, and advocate uh, Barbara Aerosmith-Young talking about how she changed her brain through innovative, innovative cognitive exercises um, that she developed to reverse her own severe learning disabilities way before anybody knew it was even possible. And some of you may know also about her book called The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. Um, that's also, that was out a few years ago, but now there's a, it's an updated version. Um, so you might want to check that out because um, there's just so much goodness here. And we're hearing more on that personal. We're getting really personal here. Um, so just before the break, uh, Barbara was talking about how hard it was to go through school and feeling like a loner or you know, feeling alone, isolated rather. And, and, um, and uh, you know, she wrote backwards. She, she, she wrote backwards. She, uh, words were backwards. She wrote from right to left and had to learn left to right. And um, But her parents were there. And I, just during the break, uh, we 
we were just chatting, and I was just saying that when you have parents, and I see this with a lot of the Aerosmith parents, the Aerosmith and Aerosmith parents, um, that belief in, in your child, when, when a per, and any human being, whether it's about cognitive capacities or anything else, as a psychologist, I know that if someone believes in you, it makes a big difference. I don't know if you want to say anything else about your, your folks or, um, and how they kind of emotionally held a space for you even when it was difficult. You know, would you be able to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, they, they, were, they really, really did. And, and again, given that this was a time when there wasn't really understanding of, of learning difficulties at all or learning disabilities. I like the term difficulty versus disability. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they, they believed in me. I mean, they believed um, that, you know, that I was valuable. They, they loved me. They, they, I mean, I think about the sacrifices that my mother made with the flashcards. I mean, probably wasn't fun for her to be <laughs> spending her lunch hour and after school you know, helping me, but she was absolutely determined that, um, you know, that I was going to learn to read and, and to write, and there was always this, this belief that, you know, that I would be successful. I mean, my, my fears, though, because my experience in school was kind of opposite to that, and this is what I see, no matter how much, you know, my parents would tell me, you know, that I'm amazing, that they loved me, every day I walked into that classroom, and that was actually my reality, um, mm-hmm. where... I saw that I couldn't do things that other other students could do, um, you know. So, you know, even though I knew my parents had this belief in me, that wasn't my reality. You know, my my daily reality because I spent you know five days a week, you know, all day in in the classroom. But the but the other thing that my both of my parents instilled in me, my mother was very much you know a believer in you know being of service and you know giving back. To to the community, so that that belief certainly was instilled in me. And my father was an inventor and a scientist, and he had this belief again that he instilled in me that you know if there's a problem and there's currently no solution to that problem in the world, he said it's your responsibility to hunt and try to create a solution. And I he love said that. something, That's yeah, and yeah. And then this piece, he said. And if the rest of the world says you can't do it, he said, don't be limited by conventional wisdom. He said, this is how science goes forward. And I just always held on to that because, you know, through, you know, my career, I've been told this is impossible. You know, we all know the brain is fixed. There is no neuroplasticity. And I just remembered him saying, you know, that don't be limited by this. If, if, and I believed then when I started to see the changes in myself through the application of uh, neuroplasticity that, if there was truth to what I was doing, eventually the world would come to see that. And here we are now in the age of you know, neuroplasticity, neuroscience, and everything I was saying 40 years ago, now we know to be true. So um, I, I feel incredibly grateful and blessed, you know, in in my parents and their support and really the belief systems that they instilled in me. Yeah, well, that I, I love. I embrace this concept of being a possibilitarian, and it sounds like your dad was that, and that was instilled in you that okay, and it's like okay, this is a challenge, and um, and sometimes the most important challenges, the most important discoveries come from the most difficult challenges, and the motivation, having lived through lived through what you did, um, knowing how devastating it is to have learning differences, uh, and and struggle so much, um, that that gave you the the hood but to, to keep persevering. It, it really did. And then, you know, when I saw the change in myself, and, and I knew it wasn't compensation because I had tried every compensation that, that existed. I even invented some, right? And, and, yes, with that heroic effort, I managed to get up to graduate school. But, you know, compromising my immune system, um, you know, pushing myself beyond any humane limits. I would never ask anybody to, to do it. I did sleeping overnight in the library, um, you know, working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, sleeping four hours a night. Um, and, you know, so I knew what that could could do. But the thing is, the compensations never can fully work because you're trying to compensate for something that isn't working properly. Mm-hmm. And, and then in fact, we're actually seeing that in the research to me, which is fascinating that, um, you know, that the brains of these students, like my brain, are working 
so much harder, right? We're seeing they're hyper-connected, like they're over-connected in certain areas to compensate for areas where they're under-connected. So exactly what my experience was, that these areas are working really, really hard trying to do something that they're actually really not designed to do to perform, you know, the functions of those areas that are underperforming. And, you know, so what I saw after I got the, the breakthrough for myself was, I, like I could actually learn in what I call real time, whereas before I lived in what I called lag time. I was always hours behind everybody else in understanding things, and sometimes even, even no matter how many hours I spent, I couldn't understand it. Now I could actually listen to a conversation, listen to a discussion, listen to a documentary, and understand it as it was happening, and that was profound. And so I knew something critical must have changed in my brain because. I, you know, for 26 years, I had never been able to do that. And after I got to a certain point in the cognitive program, I just was able to do that and do it without any kind of effort. So yeah. at that point, I thought, this is, like, really positive, and I want to start taking it out into the world to help other people that are struggling and then meeting people that didn't always have the same difficulties I had and then creating more and more programs for a whole range of difficulties. And and that was sort of the, the beginning of, of my mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, you know, starting at the end of, of, you know, talking about these incredible programs that are helping people, um, it's like, what was the turning point? Can you talk, you, you mentioned at the very beginning about Luria's work um, and um, and about the about the rat experiments of learning. Um, can you... Can you talk about? Can you talk a little bit about that turning point? Because because a lot of people, the people, who, those of us who know you know you know it kind of what happened. But those of you who don't know are probably going, what is she talking about? Uh, cognitive <laughs> exercises, right? Um, yeah. Because this is really this is where the you know the the innovation happened. So you you were you, things weren't working, and then you you learned about that that fellow that soldier who had a certain part of his brain injured, who looked a lot like you, and um, and then you learned about the rat research. So can you just talk a little bit about that turning point and and how you even thought of then starting, you know, to, to yeah, you know, what these these quote unquote cognitive exercises were that you started experimenting with. Absolutely. So I mean, I remember vividly. It was August of 1977. I mean, it's like imprinted in my brain. I can see exactly where I was, and I was in graduate school at OISE at University of Toronto, studying school psychology because I, I you know, my sort of university degrees were really trying to understand more about myself. You know, mm -hmm. child development, school psychology. You know, knowing something was wrong, but not really being able to figure out what it was and to solve a problem. You kind of have to know what's the nature of the problem you're trying to solve. So I was at graduate school really, really struggling and had gone to all my professors and said, I think I have a learning disability. And, of course, they said, well, you can't be in graduate school and have a learning disability because at that time there wasn't a concept of being gifted and learning disabled, which now right. was not possible. So they, they discounted me. And at that point, someone handed me Lurie's book, The Man with the Shattered World, and that's where my whole life changed because I saw my problems on the, the pages of the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, yeah, we're going to hear more about Luria and the, and the animal research um, and also the research about uh, Barbara's own work that's been happening, um, uh, Bar Dr. Uh, Laura Boyd and another and other folks um, who are doing some great um, uh, um, looking at the functional MRI research and um, brain changes that are happening with the, those who are experiencing the Aerosmith program. So stick around, folks. There's more great stuff to come right after the break. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. You have too little time to shop. 
So try Farm Fresh to you. They deliver organic food the way nature intended, delivered straight to your home or office, economically. Visit our web advertiser page and click on Farm Fresh to you now. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. If you're not in the U.S., listen up. SureTrader is one of the most trusted and reliable names in share trading. With 6 to 1 leverage and other perks, SureTrade is the best for penny stocks and day trades. To find out more, visit our advertiser page and click on the SureTrader banner. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Com. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just tuning in, we have with us today, we're so lucky to have with us today, doc, uh, not doctor, but uh, Barbara Aerosmith-Young, who was featured in Norman, uh, Dr. Norman Deutsch's book, The Brain That Changes Itself, and Howard Eaton's award-winning children's book called The Brain Pioneer, and has written her own book, um, and it's just now come out a revised edition, updated edition, called The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. And um, for those of you been listening it's you you already i'm sure if you don't know didn't know already you know this woman is phenomenal she's um, moved mountains that didn't weren't supposed to be movable um and just before the break we were talking about how uh, how um uh how Barbara was really, she had these, these severe learning challenges, and then she learned about this, uh, she got handed this book. And so let's carry on from there, Luria's book, um, and how that then, uh, that kind of was a breakthrough for you. It truly was. It was the book was called "The Man with the Shattered World," and it told the story of a Russian soldier who, uh, in a battle in uh, World War II, had a very localized brain wound. And this book was a combination of Zazetsky, who's a soldier, writing his journal, talking about his experiences after the wound, and then Luria explaining what was going on in his brain. And, and this man, before the wound, you know, he'd been uh, gifted in mathematics, um, you know, very, very successful after the wound he couldn't tell time i'm reading this i'm 25 26 i can't tell time um Mm -hmm. he talks about how he can't understand concepts concepts or relationships like something like a fraction like he knows what one is he knows what four is but you put the one over a four it's a part a relationship of a part to a whole he couldn't understand that i at you know, 25, 26, couldn't understand that. Uh, things like greater than, less than, all these conceptual, um, you know, understandings he no longer could do. I hadn't been able to do them since birth. So now I knew that my problem, which I knew I had, was that part of my brain wasn't working. I mean, before it was kind of this amorphous sense of something really isn't right, but I don't know what it is. And to be able to solve a problem, you have to understand what is the nature of the problem. So I knew, okay, my brain isn't working. And so I started reading more of Luria's work to try to understand, you know, what was going wrong. And then at the same time, you know, what am I going to do about it? So that was when I came across Rosenschweig's work out of Berkeley. And he was working with rats, which were a lot easier to work with than people, and finding that if you provided rats with a lot of stimulations, lots of toys to play with, um, and then you gave them a little rat intelligence test, which is running a maze. The rats with lots of stimulation learnt the mazes more efficiently than rats with less stimulation. And then he was able to look at the brains afterwards, and he found that that stimulation had led to neurophysiological changes, so more dendrites, so more um, branches on the neurons, uh, more neurotransmitters. So basically that stimulation had led to positive changes in the brain, which led 
led to better learning. And then he had one line, well, actually two lines in one of his articles. One, he talked about differential stimulation leading to differential effects. So the idea was if you could target the stimulation to a specific function in the brain, maybe you could change that function. And then he put down the challenge. He said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take this knowledge and translate it into education to change the possibility of the learner? And that was like a gauntlet thrown down, you know, in front of me. And I thought, okay, I have a very specific part of my brain not working based on Luria's interpretation, and can I find an activity or a task that will make that part of the brain work and strengthen it? And I had no idea if, if it would work because, you know, everybody was saying the brain is fixed, you can't change it, this is not possible, but I was desperate and I was determined and I figured, you know, what do I have to lose but time and I couldn't tell time, so I figured, let me try. And so I created the first exercise using clocks. Not that I particularly wanted to learn how to tell time. That wasn't my intention. But I wanted to make that part of my brain process relationships, which it couldn't do. And to interpret time, you have to process a relationship between the hour hand and the minute hand. And and I was terrible. I had to have somebody help me. And at one point I was wearing three watches on my wrist and um, I was being very heavy. It didn't really do much. Uh, but over time, through trial and error and experimentation, I came up with you know, drawing clocks, starting to see the relationships. You know, it was hundreds of hours. Uh, and then eventually I could tell time, but I wasn't feeling cognitive change. And then there's this whole idea of complexity. So I kept making it more difficult and more complex to make my brain work even harder. So I added a second hand. So now I could read a clock with hours, minutes, and seconds, and that was great, but still not feeling change. And it was the next level. So I added a fourth hand, which was a fraction of a second. And it was at the point of basically getting 100% accurate and doing that kind of at light speed as quickly as was humanly possible that my world changed, right? And, and that's where I knew that this was forcing my brain to process relationships because now I could listen to conversations. I could actually open a math book and look at the formula and understand it from first principles rather than just trying to memorize. I could read a page and understand it in the book as I read it, and I could read the next page and connect it to that page, whereas before I would have had to read that page 10 or 15 times and still not be certain that I understood it. Um, so at that point, I thought, okay, I have some other areas of difficulty. I was very clumsy. Um, I couldn't create spatial maps. I was always getting lost. So I went back into Luria, tried to figure out exercises for those two areas, created them, went through the same process with different exercises, and now I can read maps. I can navigate. I travel all around the world. I don't get lost. Um, I am coordinated. You know, I can actually play sports. Um, so I really realized there was value in putting these two lines of research together. In, if you can identify the function, then you have to find an activity or task that will stimulate or work that function. And I believe my work is, you know, one way into the brain and working these areas to strengthen them. And there are probably multiple ways into the brain to do this. And this is, you know, what I've developed and created. And now we train teachers all around the world. Um, and the school that you mentioned in Vancouver, Eaton Aerosmith is one of those um, schools that offers the program to individuals from elementary school right up to adults. And now we're working with people with acquired brain injury. Yeah, well, this is what I was going to say. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's brilliant. It's starting with the kids, but then, um, you know, for I, I used to work in a, in a rehab center also um, and, and also worked with people who had had brain injuries as well. Uh, this is way back in the 1980s. Um, but the, uh, I mean, I would love to get you and Jill Bolt to get Taylor together, uh, you know, my stroke mm. of insight. Um, and, um, um, and, and, and talk about this because this, there's so many, if you haven't already, there's just so much possibility here about the reawakening. But one of the critical things that I recall in her book is, you know, there's the sooner you can, can get active, 
brain, the more likely you're going to be able to, you know, better because you're exercising it. Otherwise, it's atrophying. And um, and and but you don't give up on it. It's like you know those areas are there. And um, and so those of you who are listening, we are going to have to go to break uh, in just a flash here. But um, who maybe uh, have or you know, have a loved one who's had a stroke um, or other uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, uh, this is this is relevant to you too. It's not just for kids. I mean, it's great for kids as well, and it's great for everyone. But um, um, but anyway, this is this has huge and far-reaching implications. So stick around. You're going to hear more and about some of the new initiatives and a little bit about the research when we come back. Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's New Roots Herbal.com. VMware is a fresh perspective for virtualization on the cloud. Shaping the future, this all in one platform delivers virtual cloud service on any cloud. Visit our HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on VMware. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. For the best in business class travel, count on Cheapo Air. Cheapo Air has the best price guarantee, 24-7 customer service, and easy booking online or by phone. To experience your hassle-free journey, start by going to HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on Cheapo Air. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, Food as Medicine Health Tips, Easy Allergy-Free Recipes, and Creative Culinary Inventions. The award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! Plant-Based Recipes for a Gluten-Free Diet at Amazon.com or visit YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just joining us, we are here with Barbara Aerosmith Young talking about a whole new method of overcoming learning disabilities like dyslexia, like um, even things around coordination, um, and but also even around um, post-traumatic brain injury implications and so forth. So, so can we just start a little bit? Talk a little bit about the um, research that's coming out, and and um, and also maybe we can talk about those the new programs that you've got happening. Absolutely. So, I mean, to me, the research is um, it's, it's very rewarding. It, it's it feels like in this past year, sort of 40 years of what I've been saying is all coming together. So we've had lots of research over the years, really looking at outcome measures, so looking at as individuals go through this program, they accelerate in the rate of learning, cognitive abilities change, academic abilities change, social emotional abilities change. But now what we're seeing for the first time, we're having the opportunity to go in and look into the brain and see what's changing in the brain that's leading to these behavioral changes. We and that's in, you know, 1977, I postulated that this work is changing the brain, which is leading to these other changes. And now we're taking kind of a, a look in and we're seeing some really fascinating things. So, I mean, one of the things we're seeing is that the brains of students with learning difficulties um, are actually different than students without learning difficulties, which makes sense. I mean, that was my experience. And 
uh, you know, that what they're having to do, the brains are having to work so much harder than the brains of students without learning difficulties. And that's that kind of heroic effort. They're trying to compensate for the areas of difficulty. And what the research is showing us is over time, as students go through this program, and we're looking at students in the six-week cognitive intensive program, which is doing the exercise that I struggled with, which is reasoning and relationships. And then we're looking at students over the one-year academic year program. And we're seeing in both cases that this hyperconnectivity, so the brain having to work really inefficiently and too hard, is starting to calm down. And these underconnected areas are starting to strengthen. And at the end of one year, the, the brains of the students that have gone through this program are starting to approximate the brains of the students without the difficulties. So that, to me, is, is really, really incredibly powerful and, and what we uh, want to see. And we're seeing some critical networks change. So there's this, um, what's called the salience network. And if we think of salience, it's kind of like what's critical, what's important, what should we be paying attention to, what's necessary in our environment. And we're seeing that a lot of students with learning difficulties aren't, um, that, that area isn't functioning as well as it should be. And as the students go through the program, that area starts to improve. So they, they start to be able to perceive in their world what's important, you know, what's necessary, and and then what should they do about that? And I, I think about, you know, one of the students that we just interviewed for the revision and the update of, of my book, and he said, you know, one day he walked into his classroom, I think he's in grade 7, and he said, where have I been all my life? Like, how come I didn't see these things? And we hear that over and over again with these students. It's almost like they've been asleep or in a fog um, because their world hasn't really been salient. I mean, they haven't noticed the cues and picked up what's important as other students have and we're changing the brain to allow them to do that and that's essential for learning so you know that's that's really you know to me really exciting and it's it's sort of putting the the um kind of stamp on what's happening in the brain. And we're doing this research both at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois with Dr. Greg Rose and then at UBC with uh, Dr. Lara Boyd's team. And we're really starting kind of a global research in this initiative. So the program is going into a school in Estonia in September and we're in conversation with a researcher at the University of Tallinn in Estonia. So she's going to start uh, investigating, again, students going through this program. We're working with a team of researchers at a university in Madrid, uh, again, seeing changes in visual spatial ability, changes in planning abilities, uh, working memory. Um, so to me, it's really exciting that, I mean, I don't want to say that the world is catching up, but in, in a sense, we're now going in and seeing what we've seen behaviorally for 40 years. Now we're seeing you know, seeing the brain changes that, that are supporting that. And my, really my, my goal is to develop a research institute and bring researchers from all around the world to start to investigate, you know, more and more in terms of how we can improve the program, how we can even benefit students more than we're currently doing. So mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, that's my vision. I'm committed to every single child that's in this program around the world, and we're now in over 100 schools in 10 countries, um, to ensure that they get the best possible delivery of the program, and I believe the research will help us do that. That's fantastic, and and if you ever, if any of you want to you know, be moved to, to some tears, <laughs> if you go to the TeresaNicasio.com page and, and go to her page and watch some of the uh, YouTubes, and particularly of, of some of the kids and parents who've been through it, you you will you you won't you, you won't be sorry you did. Um, real quickly, uh, what's can you talk a little bit about Mark Watson's BrainX program? Oh, absolutely. So there's the Watson Center Society for Brain Health, which is uh, in the Vancouver region. I think it's in Surrey. And uh, that initiative started uh, just a few years ago. And we had seen over the years some people with traumatic brain injury that had been through the program and, and achieved benefit. And Mark was quite passionate about this group. So asked, you know, could we um, start uh, an initiative to apply the work to people with traumatic brain injury? And 
And we started with a research study uh, with Dr. Virgie Babel at UBC, and we found at the three-month mark, again, the same similar kinds of changes that we're seeing in students with learning difficulties, we, we found like they became, um, you know, able to reason, to be able to process information, and we saw changes in the brain. So now uh, this initiative is going forward, and we're seeing really remarkable results. You know, again, similar changes in the brain because this application is changing, you know, networks in the brain, connectivity in the brain. So allowing these individuals, you know, to get back out into the world and function. I mean, it was this individual that was an elementary school teacher that I interviewed for the update of the book and couldn't work after he had been hit by a drunk driver. Um, and now he's back teaching elementary school full-time um, as a result of the strength and cognitive capacity. So this huge application, even cognitive aging, as we're getting older and we're not as sharp, there's application of this work to that, that group Terrific. of people. Terrific. Thank you for joining us, and thank all of you. It, it was wonderful having you here, Barbara. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in today, and I want to thank our, our sponsor, New Roots Herbal, for making this show possible. Next time we'll have Marilee McLean, and um, I hope you've all enjoyed this show. I'm Teresa, and this is the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. Until next time, have a wonderful week. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio, is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com. Or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. Shh, over here. Here's a secret for a virus-free computer. ESET. They've been a pioneer in the antivirus industry for over 25 years. 25 years of innovative, top-rated antivirus protection. ESET's award-winning security solutions provide a safe online experience for over 100 million home and business computer owners. They are so affordable, fast, and simple to use. So be gone, you blue screen of death. ESET's on my computer. If it's not on yours, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on ESET now. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. HealthyLife.net, where positive overcomes negative.